Okay. Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. Uh, let me just check to make sure all of my numbers are up before we get started here. Let me just see if I'm on. And okay. I just want to make sure that uh, you guys can hear me. So the first person that says that, Kevin, I can hear you, then we will be going into this teaching. All right? So can you hear me? OK, I see Ginger Roll. Good evening, Paulette Hunt. I just want to confirm, Zania Williams, I just want to confirm if if you guys can hear me, and once you can hear me, I can go. Sonia Trotter, Monique Burrows, okay, Ali Lovable. So, can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, Shanika said she can hear me. Okay, beautiful. I just wanted to confirm that. So, let me just, uh, <clears throat> let me just get this thing sorted out here. And here we go. Okay, great. We're good. All right, so let's get right into it. And uh, before I get started, uh, if any of you guys work for Cable Bahamas, which is my internet provider, could you please tell them Brother Kevin needs to have his internet fixed, okay? Because I right now operating off of my iPad, which is a disgrace because I have like uh, hundreds of dollars of equipment that gives a better quality picture and sound. And I can't use none of it <laughs> because uh, my good, decent internet service provider uh, have yet to fix my problem. <clears throat> but nevertheless, as I would have mentioned earlier, our topic tonight that I felt led to teach on was uh, the mystery behind a masquerading spirit. All right? Uh, for those of you that are just coming on, Pamela Williams, what's up? <laughs> It's nice to see all of you guys on board. We're in for a very, very good treat tonight. And I hope that you would get your, your notepads, get your uh, devices, whatever to do recording, because I have a few scriptures that we're going to take our time and go through in order to understand the fullness of what we're discussing tonight. And again, our topic is uh, the mystery or the secret behind masquerading spirits. All right. Now, before I get into the definition of a masquerading spirit, and then take the teaching from there, what what I wanna what I wanna show you tonight is how I study the scriptures and how I extract revelation from them, which I would advise you to do the same, so that when you do read the Bible, you're not just reading words, letters, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, verses and calling it a date. What you're in fact doing is because you're more on a spiritual level, which you should be once you would have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, then the idea is to see things from a spiritual perspective. And for the most part, I would say to people, you know, you pray for that. Whenever you go to read the scriptures, you pray and you say, Lord, open up my spiritual eyes so that I may see. And I can assure you there would be scriptures that you would have read probably a thousand times over. And then there is one time that you would have read it, but not only does it give you a revelation, which is what we're in pursuit of, but it gives you a deeper understanding of the invisible world or the spiritual world. So you know the uh, basis of my ministry is dealing with things from a spiritual level, which should be the basis of all ministry. No ministry should be exempted from that because once you're dealing with uh, spirituality, religion, and Christianity, you're dealing with the unseen world. You're talking about devils and demons and Jesus and God. And these things are not visible or tangible. So as such, you cannot look at the Bible when reading it from a humanistic perspective, meaning that you're limited to your five senses. If that is the case, or if that is your approach, then you would never really get the revelation that you seek. So before I get into it, I just want to show you two scriptures and how you look at the scripture and rather than just reading the surface, it will really take you 
into the spiritual world and you don't even realize it, all right? So the first scripture that I want us to look at, <clears throat> I want us to look at Job, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 9. We're going to read from verse 9 to verse 10. And really, again, we're not really into it as yet. I'm just giving you a method to use when you study the scriptures, when you're reading the scriptures. Like I said, just pray, Lord, show me what is it that you need me to see in this particular scripture? What, what is the spiritual uh, implication of this entire story? I don't just want the surface of it. See, the surface of a scripture could be um, John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave it. See, you know that already. You hear it a thousand times to the point you're probably bored of it. But when you pray and say, Lord, give me spiritual insight. What is the spiritual implication of this scripture? Because I want understanding, I want revelation. I want to walk away from this with a concrete understanding. So in doing that, let's look at Job chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 9 to verse 10. And remember, this have nothing to do with the teaching tonight. I'm just trying to show you a method in which you, could which you should study. In Job chapter 1, verses 9 to 10, and this is God and Satan having this conversation. And Satan is now answering God. Now remember, we want revelation, right? So let's look at the characters. Satan is not a physical being. God is not a physical being. So this entire text we're about to read here is dealing with two invisible beings, two beings that we cannot see. We cannot, uh, our five senses cannot decipher them in the spiritual realm, okay? So in Job chapter 1 verse 9, it says, Then Satan answered the Lord. Now we're coming off of the heels where God placed the spotlight on Job and said, Look at my servant Job, who issues evil. You know, he's a good man. He takes care of his family. He makes sacrifices for their sins, blah, 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 right? So in verse 9 of Job 1 says, then Satan, let's keep this clear, Satan is an invisible being. He's not tangible. He's not physical. Then, let me put it this way, the spirit Satan then, the spirit Satan answered the Lord. The Lord is not physical. He is also invisible. And said, does Job fear God for nothing? So basically Satan is responding to God and says, you hear bragging about Job and how much he honor you but the only reason why he's doing that is because you you he can, he can explain to him now why in verse 10 he said does job fear you for nothing then in verse 10 verse 10 is where the revelation is and this is when you look with spiritual eyes and you're not just reading the surface of the scripture anymore you're going beyond that this is how you get revelation so verse 10 says remember with the context of this entire boat why is it that job reverence god verse 10 of job chapter 1 said Who's speaking here? Satan. And who's he speaking to? God. And they're both invisible beings. So verse 10 says, Satan is speaking, Has not thou made an hedge about him? Who's him? Job. Okay, let me put this down and let me make this plain for you. God... And Satan is having a conversation. And this conversation is about, a, is about a human on the earth. Job is not privy to this conversation. He doesn't know none of this. So God is bragging on him in the heavens as he is dialoguing or conversing with Satan the spirit. Satan's response to God was the only reason why uh, Job reverence you or even care to follow you is because, and he told him why, you have a hedge of protection. Now, if you continue reading, you will miss the entirety of what has been said here. Because what has just been said here is that Satan, through his admission, is revealing to us, the readers, that there is a spiritual hedge around this man that no one could see, which I believe all believers have. There's a spiritual hedge around him that no one could see, hence... Satan is limited in his approach to attack Job. Now, the scripture gave some more information because the scripture also uh, said to us 
why it's there. And he said it's only there because Satan, when you read verses 7, 8, and coming down to 9, not Satan, but Job, is following the laws of God. When he sins, his children sins, he goes and he follows the rituals to expunge the sin from them. So in doing what God has, has required of them to deal with whatever issues, then those rules that he's following is now keeping this invisible hedge around him. Okay? Now, he cannot see that. We would have never known this. We would have never known this had Satan himself not repeat this in his response to God. So here it is, a spiritual revelation is being released to the reader. So this is why you don't just read the scripture. Who is speaking? Who are, the, who are the characters? What are they speaking about? What is the context of their conversation? What is it referring to? Because all of this now puts you in line with now revelation, meaning that you go in in terrain, you're going below the surface of the scripture. And you will glean more from that scripture spiritually than if you just were reading it for reading its sake or to say, okay, I read my Bible. So this is what I'm saying to you. You say to God, God, give me revelation, give me understanding, give me insight. So Job, sorry, Satan, okay, who is the king of his evil kingdom, has just revealed to us that human beings, if they follow God in his commandments, there is an invisible hedge around them. And a hedge is a barrier that surrounds something that prevents something from the outside from coming in. But in this case, it's invisible. Because there was nothing there that was visible to say, okay, he had like a brick wall around him. No, 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 no. What was around him was invisible. That's the first revelation. The second revelation is it's there because Job is following the statutes, the laws, the commandments, the ordinances, the principles, the precepts of God Almighty. You follow me? So that is what you call spiritual revelation. When we're not just reading the surface, we're not just trying to jump to the next chapter or the next verse. What we're looking for here, because as a believer, remember now, and this is what they need to teach you in church, as a believer of Jesus Christ, your focus should be on things spiritual. Okay, people who are not growing, they're still locked down to their five senses. There's still this, this threshold that they will never cross if they keep in a natural state of observing things. And this is why the scripture says, I think in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, I think it is, verse 14, somewhere around there. And listen to what it says. It says, the things of God, okay, are foolishness to man. But then it tells us why in the next sentence. It says, because the things of God are spiritually, not physically, spiritually discerned. Basically, it's what I'm showing you right now. From the natural eye, when I look at something, I read the surface and I continue. With the spiritual eye, I see beyond what the surface is presenting. So I know many of you are saying right now, wow, I never saw that. I mean, even he said the hedge was around him. I mean, I just didn't even, I didn't even think about that part. Right. See, because your natural five senses, you're still reading with that level of understanding. But when you say, Lord, give me the spiritual understanding that I need to discern what your spiritual word is saying to me. So I'll have clarity. All right? That's number one. Let me, let me show you another one. Let's go to, I'm going to show you this last one, and then we're going to get into the teaching. <clears throat> Let's go to 2 uh, Kings. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings uh, chapter 6. All right? And we're going to read from verse uh, 15. We're going to read from verse 15 to verse 17. All right? Now, I just showed you Revelation in the book of Job. And I showed you how the scripture made it very clear to us that Satan revealed the spiritual nugget, all right, that we would have never known, we would have never known this, had he not in his response said to God that, that Job is only serving you, he, he only respect you because you taking care of him. This hedge of protection is around him. So he revealed that there was something invisible around him, there's something around Kevin 
there's something around you as a believer of Jesus Christ that no matter what they do, this, was, this is why the Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. But there's a condition though, because again, when you go back to Job, verse 7, verse 8, then you come to verse 9, there were things that Job was doing to sustain and maintain that invisible hedge of protection. And what was it? He was following the rules of God. This is why you see me pound on this so much. If you're not following the rules, if they're not teaching you the rules, then you play in church, okay? So in 2 Kings chapter 6, this is a story. Let me give you a backdrop about Elijah and his servant. Uh, it's Elijah, E-L-I-S-H-A, not Elijah. This is the second guy, Elijah and his servant. It doesn't mention the servant's name, but we believe that the servant is Gehazi. Some people pronounce it Gehazi, okay? Okay. So in verse 15 of 2 Kings 6, listen what it says. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, who is the servant? See, we need to know these things to make sense. Spiritual sense, that is. The servant would be Gehazi. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So let me bring this to layman's term for you. Elijah, at this point in time, is about 83 years old. His servant Gehazi is far younger than he was. They're in the city by the name of Dothan, all right? The Syrian army is now after them, but they didn't know this because Elijah was prophesying whenever the Syrians were coming to attack Israel. So the captain of the Syrian army said, they've had enough of Elijah. If we kill him, then Syria, sorry, Israel will never know that we are coming to ambush them. Okay? So what happens now? The servant got up early one morning to go outside and to stretch after having such a good night's sleep. And when he looked around, to his surprise, the entire Syrian army was there. And they were probably outnumbered, but a thousand to one. Okay? Clearly, Elijah, who was 80 plus years old, is no match for any of these guys. His servant is certainly no match at all. The servant runs back inside of the house, and he says, Alas, master, he's totally frantic, totally afraid. He says, Master, listen, these dudes out here, we finished. This, this is it for us. Okay, let's just say our prayers right here and let's tell God, you know, open up them pearly gates because we're coming right now. <laughs> okay? This is where he's at. But watch this. We're looking for a spiritual revelation now. We're not reading the surface of the scripture. We want to see what the crooks of the scripture is saying to us. Now, watch this. Verse 15 again of 2 Kings 6. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a house compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And a servant said unto him, Alas, master, how shall we do? What we can do now, Elijah? Verse 16. And he, who is he? We need to know because we want understanding. Who is he? He is Elijah. Who was talking to Elijah? His servant Gehazi. Okay? He said in verse 16, and he answered, so Elijah says, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Verse 17, and Elijah prayed, no, 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 stop right there. Stop right there. Stop it. Behave yourself. Stop it. Stop it. Stick to verse 16 because the revelation is right there. You've been reading it all these years and never fully understand the spiritual implication of what it was saying to us. Because now that scripture is about to reveal to us that Elijah and the boy, which was one party, the Syrian army, which was the second party, but Elijah's response is now indicating that there are two other separate parties involved that we cannot see. <laughs> I love this. I love this. So let's, let's look at the wording here. Remember now, we have uh, concluded that Elijah is speaking in verse 6 to his servant. And the first thing he said to Gehazi, he said, fear not. See, Elijah, this, this, is, this is so sweet. 
Elijah already see. He, he, he also already dismissed his five senses. See, that's what put, that, was, that is what's going to introduce fear like the young man. See, the young man is seeing in a limited view, meaning that only what he sees physically is now making him make decisions or take on emotions that are not warranted, believe it or not, for the situation if we look at it from where we're supposed to be as believers from the spiritual realm. So verse 16 says, And he which is Elijah answered and said, Fear not! Don't fear. I know you saw the entire Syrian army out there, probably about 30 or 40,000 soldiers and horses and chariots. I know this is what you saw. Now you run back in here and it's just you and I, but I'm telling you, do not fear. Now I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't fear. He's going to tell him why. Listen to what he says. He says, Fear not, for they that be with them. Back up Elijah, because you sound like you're talking out of your head. Elijah is saying that there is also another group with the Syrian army that we cannot see. See, that's what I keep telling you. The spiritual world is real. The spiritual world is the origin of all things. Anybody who don't get that concept, you might as well go backslide and go live for Satan because you lost. The spiritual world is where if you do not address things from the unseen world, you are wasting your... All you're doing is repeating the same cycle over and over of failure. He said, do not fear. And here is why you don't fear. He said, for they that be with them, sorry, with us, are more. He said, there is an invisible group here with us that outnumber the invisible group <laughs> that are with the Syrian army. But you shouldn't be shocked about that. You shouldn't be shocked about that. Because if you read your Bible, this would be this, this would be nothing surprising to you. The scriptures are unequivocally clear. What does it say? It says in Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. And correct me if I'm wrong. It says that for he, which is God, has given his angels charge over us. To keep us in not some, but all our ways, inclusive of the situation with Elijah and the boy. That as we, that if we as much as dash our foot against a stone, these same angels would gather us up in their arms, right? In the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 1, I think verses 13 to 14. And the writer says to, he says, to which, this is God speaking now, to which of the angels had I said at any point, sit here at my right hand, while I make your enemies your footstool. He said, none of them. Instead, watch what he says. He says, instead, are they not all ministering spirits? Who he's talking about? The angels, right? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth, meaning that they're being sent from heaven, sent forth to minister or to serve who? Who, who specifically? Those who are heirs to salvation, you and me. So while you may not be able to see the angel sitting right next to you while you're watching me on your tablet, your computer, so what? they're there. They're right there. They're right there as I speak to you right now. The Bible further goes on to say to us in the, uh, Psalms 34 verse 7, and it says that the angel, singular, of the Lord encamp or circle around those that fear him. Fear who? God Almighty. And then what do they do for us? They deliver us. This is what the scripture says. This is what the scripture says. Now, the next question is, okay, Kevin, I got that. That's super. I love it. But how do I get these brothers to work for me? I mean, what do I tell them? Do I give them a $1,000 seed? Do I hook them up? What? what? Tell me what I do. Because they've been telling me give 1000 I don't know if I'm going to give these angels 1000 I can get a preacher 1000 Do I give the angel 1000 too? No. No, because you can be fresh at a 2000 <laughs> You don't got to do that. I am going to tell you, and this has nothing to do with this lesson. I just want to see. I just want you to see. I want you to see. When you, you are going to love, if, if you listen to me, you will love the Bible. Because I love it. Because you're not reading the surface. You want more. You want revelation. And this is how you get it. You get it by focusing and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. And he's going to pull out those little nuggets that you've been overlooking all these years. And now the scriptures are going to open up to you. So here it is now. Elijah, all these angels are there. Gehazi, I still can't see them. You know, He still cannot see these angels. He can't see them. So Elijah had to do something for him. Yeah, let's go to verse 17. And Elijah prayed. Now this is fascinating. 
Elisha prayed, but what he said, what he, and his prayer, his prayer doesn't make sense naturally though. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Hello, Elijah. I know you're almost a hundred. You got a little recollection problem. But I thought the young man told you what he saw. In fact, you told him to don't even worry about what he saw because the invisible forces that are with you outnumber the invisible forces that's influencing the Syrian army. But what is the revelation? The revelation here is Elijah is not referring to his physical eyes. And again, this is another piece of empirical evidence that is showing you that when we rely just on our physical sight, our physical hearing, our physical five senses, then there's limitations to that. When the spiritual aspect of our being kicks in, which should be kicking in on a regular, but that only happens when we study like how I'm teaching you to do it right now, now you begin to see beyond that. So this is what I was telling you all along, especially for the people who I tell you was praying prayers back to send and I told them that it was wrong and oh, they cussed me. They, they called me everything but a child of God, all right? But this is one of the examples here. Elijah said, do not fear. Do not look at the physical Syrian army. No, they are just puppets to an invisible force that's pulling the strings in their life as well as the, the invisible angels that are here waiting to fight on our behalf. Again, Kev, how do we get the angels to fight on our behalf? Okay, I'm going to give you this last scripture, then I'm going to finish here, and then we're going to get into tonight's lesson. But I just want to give you this because I really want you to have a hunger for the Word of God. And the only way that could happen, if someone teaches you how to truly study the Word of God, not a bunch of screaming and shouting, and yeah, you don't got time for all that. I want to understand, okay, what this brother saying. So let's go to Psalms. I'm going to wrap this up right here. Let's go to Psalms uh, one. Three. Let's go to Psalms 103. Okay. Let's go to Psalms 103, verse 20. You should be praying right now. Father God, listen, I love it. This makes so much sense what this dude saying to me. Father, open my spiritual eyes. Just like how you do it for Gehazi, to open my spiritual eyes so I could see beyond the red man, see beyond. The, the, the monies, the interest I owe the bank, see beyond this sickness and disease. Open my eyes because clearly there are available resources invisibly or spiritually that I cannot see. And based on what this brother showed me tonight, it is, it is, it is available. So if Elijah and every other man of God or woman of God can tap into it, then I want to tap into it too. So show me, Jesus. Show me. I don't want to be here crying to you for resources when the resources are right here. But it's just that I haven't been taught to see it spiritually. Wow. Just like that. So how do we get the invisible help to help to, to fight us, to work for us? How do we employ and deploy the angelic host that has been made available to us based on the scriptures I gave you earlier? Here's how we do it. In Psalms 103, verse 20, which is a this is a spiritual principle as it relates to how we uh, employ and deploy, excuse me, the angelic host. I hear people, I did a whole teaching on this about the mystery behind angels and, and one of the reasons why I did the teachings was because so many people I would hear in their prayer Father Lord send the angels Lord I send the angels after so and so and, and I can send brimstone and fire and, and the angels do this you, you have you have hello no authority none of you know to tell no angel what to do no scripture if you understand the word of God, gives you the right as a believer to dispatch an angel at your will. It don't work that way. There's protocol. Now, what is this protocol? Psalms 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye, his who? Angels. And what do these angels do? These angels excel in strength and what do they do? That do his commandments. Now, who is this his? God. Because remember now, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, it is clear. The revelation is the angels are to serve us. 
they minister to us. That's what the word serve. They are ministering spirits. They are sent. The Bible says they are sent forth, meaning that they are sent from the heavenlies or the spiritual realm. Go. You all are assigned to Kevin. You all are assigned to Mary and Tom and Phaedra and uh, whomever. You are assigned there. Now, even though they are assigned there, remember, the scriptures are clear. It says that we are uh, joint heirs with God and, and heirs with Jesus Christ, right? So what that simply means is that there is a part God, the, the heavenly host would do, and then there's a part that we do. It's all throughout the scriptures. He says, whatever you bind here on earth, which is current, has already been B-O-N-D, B-O-U-N-D, past tense, in the heavens. Whatever we loose here current has already been loose in heaven. So basically, heaven is waiting on us. But this is nothing new to you. I've been teaching you this, that in order to have things to manifest in the physical realm from the spiritual world, there have to be a cooperation or an agreement between things that are spiritual and things that are physical. I tell you this all the time. So this is nothing new to you. So in verse 20 here of Psalms 103, it's teaching us how to employ and deploy the angels of the Lord or the invisible host that has been assigned to us to fight the invisible army that's coming against us, not the people. See, the people, the physical people are influenced by the invisible army that they cannot see. They don't even know it's there, but they're being influenced. I did a teaching on this too, how our spirits influence us. That's what their purposes are, to coerce us, to conform to their will by giving them the right true covenants to facilitate their good or evil in our lives. But you know this already if you're a follower of, my, of this ministry. So anyway, he says here, Verse 20, bless the Lord, ye angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments. So what do the angels do? Do they do what you say? No. Do they do what the bishop say? No. Do they do what the pastor, the apostle, the pope, the chief apostle, square root four, pope, whatever? No. The angels that God has given us, they're right next to us, and we're in trouble. And we're saying, Lord, help us. And God is saying, if this person only knew the protocol, they would never ask me and say, Lord, help me. Watch this. This is so powerful, yeah? Verse 20 says, Bless the Lord, all his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments. Listen, listen. That do his commandments. Hearkening. What does that word hearkening mean? It means to listen. What are they doing? They're listening unto the voice. Listen unto the voice of his what? Word. What are the angels doing? The angels that he's given charge over you, according to Psalms 91 verses 11 and 12. They're, they're next to you. But even though they send them, they don't just work for you. There's something that you are, he said, they're listening. They're listening. Listen carefully. Let's read this again. They're listening for what? They're listening for the voice of his word. What does this mean? The word of God, which is the scriptures, is the voice of God. So now it makes sense. Now, how do I deploy them? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that has risen up against me in judgment, I cut. When I begin to speak the word of God, which is the voice of God, that is what activate the angels of God that has been assigned to my life to shut down whatever invisible force is coming up against me through who, what, wherever, environment, whatever it is. So this is why I keep saying to you, sending prayer back to send, I send back Obey two times. Any witchcraft coming after me, I send it back seven times. That is not scripture. That is not the word of God. God has given you the protocols. And the minute they start teaching you the protocols in church and stop screaming and talking stupidness, you will be a more effective Christian. You will advance more in life. So I'm finished with that. I just wanted to show you how when you look, you got to speak it. Why I keep telling you, why you think your brother Kevin always is saturated you with scripture? Why when you hear me praying, I always pray in scripture after scripture? Because the scriptures are clear. It says that the, the word of God is the voice of God. Every time you read the words from this Bible, the, you know what the angels hear? They're hearing the voice of God. That's what they're hearing. They're hearing you. They're hearing the voice. So hold on, hold on. Be here. Hold on. What they say? No weapon form against me shall prosper. Look, we need to go up there in the future and begin to shut down everything that was standing in Kevin's way and move it out the way because we are attending not so much Kevin, but the voice of the living word of God through the scriptures. Get out of here that nonsense. Talking fool. No. No. So let me calm down. Let me calm down a little bit. I still a little excited. All right? Can't forgive a brother. <laughs> okay, I get excited. And, and this is what you call studying, man. I don't just want to study. You know, I know I have a lot of colleagues, you know, and a lot of times when you hear them, 
uh, on, on YouTube, you know, and so on. They won't sound so educated. I don't get time for that. I'm in no big words. Huh? I, can be, I barely know the little words. I need someone who could break it down for me, where I can understand and make it applicable. I don't want to hear all them big words. Anything beyond four letters in your wording, I can have a problem with that. Okay? I need simple understanding so I could clearly begin to articulate the word of God. All right? Now, let's get into tonight's topic. <clears throat> Tonight's topic, as I said earlier, is titled, The Mystery Behind Masquerading Spirits. All right? Now, in order to understand this, we must first define the word uh, masquerade, all right? Which is where we get masquerading from. And I'm going to give you scriptures. You know me, I don't pull nothing out of no heart. I, I'm giving you scriptures to support everything that I say. All right? Now, um, uh, the word masquerade is someone or something that never reveals its true identity. It's always hiding uh, more commonly behind a mask. A lot of people don't realize that a lot of cultural stuff that they follow in their particular communities or countries, such as um, Brazil, how they have a, a carnival, the Caribbean, they deal with Bacchanal, the Bahamas, we deal with Junkanoo. And a lot of them, most of the people that follow these traditions and do it, they, they, they have no idea of the origin in which these things came from. And these, uh, these festivals, they call it, all of them came, they were originated from African roots. And these were the festivals, the beating of the drums, the shaking of the cowbells, the wearing the different masquerades, okay? This is now hiding the identity of the spirits that the beating of the drums, the fast beating, that, that, that isn't no any random beating. That is a particular beat that was given to them by the spirits, the some gomas that is, or the witch doctors, to call up a specific spirit. And this is why you see people be, begin to go into a trance because the whole purpose of it is for the spirit to enter them. And when the spirit begin to enter them, they would start moving like a snake, barking like a dog, dropping on the ground, rolling all over like an alligator. But this is how they invite the spirit. So from African ancestry, we get masquerading. In fact, if you go on YouTube and you type in the word uh, uh, masquerading, masquerading dance, you will see a lot. They still practice this in, uh, in, in Africa, Benin, Africa, Ghana, Africa, Nigeria, where the villages have these, uh, these big outfits. And the, the big, it will start spinning around, spinning around, spinning around, spinning around, and go all around the, the dusty courtyard, but there's nobody underneath it. So the guys will come and lift it up, there's no one there. So the spirit, the spirit has now been invited. And now the spirit, of course, and remember, you will never see the festival happening outside of the beating of the drums because it's literally summonsing the spirit. So the spirit, if, if you were to see the spirit in its natural state, you'd probably lose your mind how gross it looks. So it masquerades, it, it hides itself behind a mask. So in, in Junkanoo, Carnival, Bacchanal, uh, whatever festival they have, they have these, uh, the beating of the drums. But people are saying, you know, this culture, we have in fun, this is our culture. That's not your culture. That's a culture you inherited. But what you don't know is the origin of what you inherited. All right, but we can go I'll, I'll do that on another, on another date. So masquerading spirits are spirits that show up never revealing their true identity. And for the most part, for the most part, this happens in your dreams. Where a spirit will show up. You, you have, there's no one that's listening to me right now that has not had the experience. Even for those who think that they don't dream which is nonsense, you do dream, but clearly it's erased from you prior to you getting up, or even when you get up, it's immediately erased from you. So you have no spiritual intelligence of what was being revealed to you from the spiritual realm, just like the case with Elijah and the boy. So, it's, so whenever you see that, you're under heavy spiritual warfare attack. And whatever is pending for you, it's to shut you down, but to gain the advantage, the information you would have gotten in the dream is immediately erased. So I suggest if you want to know how to fix that, go to my blog site, uh, uh, kevinlaewing.blogspot.com, 
which I have a cadre of articles specifically on that. I'm not going to go into all that tonight. So anyway, a masquerading spirit is someone or something that conceals or hides their true identity. But in this case, we're talking about a spirit. And the spirit itself, this is where we're really going to go. The spirit itself isn't any spirit. There's specific spirits that's coming to a person. But remember, they're masquerading. They're not showing, showing their true identity. So the reality is, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself here, the reality is the spirit itself could be a spirit of, of poverty. It could be a spirit of sickness. It could be a spirit of insanity. For example, uh, I remember one time somebody told me they had a dream. And this gentleman, who they don't know, walked up to them in the dream and gave them this beautiful gold ring with several hundred dollar bills, right? So to the person who was broke in reality, to them, where they are so desperate for money, this is a blessing, oh God is so good. This God sent, I know this dream is showing me God is sending somebody to bless me. And I mean, it was so real, you know, it's a beautiful gold ring, but they don't know it's a masquerading spirit. And truly the man who they see, that's the mask, but behind that mask is a spirit of poverty. Okay, it's a spirit that if this person accept what's being given to them in the dream, what do I, what, what I tell you the principle is, in order for them to manifest their evil or good, whether it's an angel of God, whether it's an angel of, of darkness, they need your agreement. How do they achieve this agreement? Whatever, is, whatever you do to interact with that spirit in the dream, you're in fact coming in agreement. So the spirit now leaves you, or the dream ends, or you wake up. So you wake up thinking it's a good dream. My Lord. The first thing they do is they call me, boy, brother Kevin, you ain't, you ain't got to interpret this one for me. I know this one. Lord showing me I can have plenty of money plus gold. Tell me more about the dream before you come to that conclusion. So when they begin to reveal it, I say, no, 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 no. First of all, do you know the stranger? Do you know the person? No. Why would a stranger be giving you money? Did the stranger speak to you? Did they know Kevin has just said they just give it to me? You know why? Because it's a masquerading spirit, which is similar to a familiar spirit. They already know you. They know the history of you. They know what you need. They know what you would bite on in the dream. So what better to entice you than something that you truly need in reality? So once you would have taken that, you literally accepted that spirit of poverty. Now it has the legal right to infiltrate your life and then facilitate further poverty, further backwardness, further bills are going to come from nowhere. Your car breaking down all the time, your washing ain't working, the only three, two of the, two, two of the four burners on the stove working, the children's school fee, all kind of stuff can break loose. You never challenge it, you never rebuke it, so you agreed with it. So that's just it, that's what I've been telling you over and over. In order for things from the spiritual world to manifest in this physical world, there has to be, there's no other way this can happen. There has to be an agreement between things that are spiritual and things that are physical. See, you sitting back and say, child, I ain't listening to that. That, that can't touch me. I am covered with the blood. You could be covered with the blanket. It doesn't matter. That, you, that don't supersede spiritual, law, supersede spiritual laws at all. So if you don't know the law, this is what I'm keeping constantly uh, I'm reiterating to you, the when you see me teaching you the word, I'm teaching you the rules. Because when you don't know the rules, then you become a victim. But in this case, you volunteer to be a victim. Because you are under this illusion and delusion that because you're a child of God, uh, nothing can happen to you. What do you mean? You're a child of God and people rob you. You're a child of God and... Uh, you get jeopardy or whatever. So that, 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 that doesn't change anything. So let's look, at some, let's look at some scriptures. Let's look at some scriptures to put some more meat on this. Okay? And the first scripture I want us to look at here is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I hope this is making sense to you because I'm going to do my best to make this as simple as possible because again, I need you to walk away with an understanding. I don't want you to walk away praising me. I want you to walk away praising God. God, thank you for the revelation. Thank you now because now I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a new strategy to deal with, with the invisible things in my life. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and uh, let's, look at, let's look at verse 13. We're gonna read from verse 13 
to verse 15 again. Just like what I taught you at the onset of this teaching, we're looking for revelation. We're not looking for reading the same scripture. We don't read 3,000 times in our lifetime. We already probably know what the scripture says. But let's, let's go beyond the scripture. Let's go underneath it. Okay? So we can understand it. We have to know the rules. If, if you don't know the rules, you, you, you might as well stop going to church. You might as well stop listening to the preacher. What you go in there for you? You might as well stay home and, and play Nintendo. Because everything is governed by laws, by rules. And if, and if you don't know the laws and the rules, honestly, you're just there taking up space. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 says, For such, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church of Corinth, and he's giving them this brilliant spiritual revelation. He says, For such are false apostles. So the word false, they mean they're not authentic, they're not real, they're fake. For such are false apostles, deceitful, circle that word, deceitful workers. They're not honest. They're deceptive. They're undermining. They're never who they're portraying themselves to be. Sound like masquerading to me. Excuse me. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Watch this now. Circle this word. Transforming. Circle that. Because we can define that before we go any further. And the word transform means to change. But before we got to the word change, let's go back to the beginning of that scripture. Because we want revelation, right? Verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 11 says, For such are false apostles. So Paul is saying these are some people among you who appear to be authentic, who appear to be real. But they could transform. They could go from spraying like they got the Holy Ghost and all of this other stuff, but yet they could just come online and cuss you stink and just slip right back into praise the Lord again. So listen to what Paul said. Paul said, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers they are, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now that there, now I can, I can, I can in fact I can end right there and just teach on that alone. Because here, here is where uh, discernment come in. Here is where you study to show yourself approved. You realize even now during this uh, COVID-19 and so on, and every time anyone comes on line or whatever, and they make a, a remark and give their opinion about the church, there are those who are quick to come and try to defend the church. I don't know why. The church don't have to be, the, this, to be Christ is the one who does that. So if you make a statement uh, about what is clear, you're not assuming based on the works, the scripture being the benchmark, you're making a righteous judgment, but then your attack, oh, touch not God's anointed, do his prophets no harm, blah, blah, blah. Touch not God's anointed. No, back up, buddy, because what I'm reading here is that there are some among you who has the ability to pretend to be, to masquerade, hello, masquerade as apostles, as uh, evangelists, as, as whatever. And that's why in my last teaching, I said to you, this is why I kept on repeating it. Forget the titles. Look at the fruit. What kind of fruit are they producing? They are claiming that they are apple trees. But every fruit that's coming from them are mangoes. Something ain't right here. Something ain't right here. Now, I, I see you got apple up there. I see the, I see the big label. Say, apple, uh, chief apostle apple. I saw that. But I'm looking at your fruit, though. And the fruit, I see all kind of grape and, and guava coming out of you. So I ain't listening to you, but don't touch God's honey. Get on my face. Because what I'm seeing here, and this is so powerful, Paul is saying to them, look here, look, don't listen to these people talk for you. Don't let these titles and them acting like they're the most powerful people in the world. Judge them spiritually. How do we do this? By using the Bible and how it tells us to do it. And how did the Bible say to do it spiritually? Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. I hear you over there in the corner screaming. I hear you calling down the heavens. I hear you saying you can do this and do this and do this in the spiritual realm and blah, blah, blah. I hear all of that, Chief Apple. But Chief Apple, the only thing I see coming from you is grape. 
something is wrong. It's called a righteous judgment. Got nothing to do with no touch and no God. So first of all, that's not God anointed. If they're producing something that's contrary to whom they claim to be. But we ain't going there tonight. I ain't got time for that right now. So, so he says here, he's showing where physical men could transform themselves. But he's saying, what we're about to read next, that this transformation is not limited to things physical. How do we notice? Let's go to verse 14. Verse 14 says, And marvel not, King James says, And no marvel, or don't be surprised, for Satan, stop right there, is Satan a physical or a spiritual being? Spiritual. So now the scripture is about to tell us now that what, what he's referring to here is a spiritual act. He said, do not be surprised in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 11. For Satan himself is transformed or he can masquerade or he can change into an angel of light. Now ain't that something? Now ain't that something? How many people who tell you the Lord or oh, angels show up to them, right? And the angels spoke to them. And the angels say, uh, uh, Pimp slap Kevin. <laughs> I don't care what you say. An angel tell me that. That's just it. Y'all too like judge people. I'm judging you. The word judging you. Because I, I cannot see an angel of God doing something that's contrary to the will of God. Again, I hear you. I see your title, I see your degrees, I see your accolades, I see how much people love you on Facebook, but the fruit that you are producing is contrary to whom you claim to be. And I am advised to judge you by not your title, not your looks, not your weave, not your snakeskin shoes. I am advised to judge you by your fruit. And when I look at this fruit, it ain't producing what, I, what you claim to be. So the scripture says that Satan has the ability, this spiritual being has the ability to transform himself into other entities, inclusive of that of an angel. Verse 15 says, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his servants, other spirits, also be transformed into ministers of righteousness. So what is it talking about? It's talking about when that, that righteous spirit of the enemy comes upon someone. They become all holy. Hallelujah. Oh, don't, don't. Oh, no, 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 brother Kevin. Oh, don't, don't stand here. This is holy ground. Holy ground, my foot, you devil. Get out of here. So when we take our time and go through the scripture, be in no rush. Because we want some revelation. I want understanding. I, I want to see things different when I leave from here. But in order to do that, we have to see exactly what is being said here. So we've recognized so far that spirits have the ability to transform themselves into different entities. Okay? This is going to be key where we're going next. So we have to log this down. Now, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to put some more meat and we're going a little bit deeper. Now, you might need your scuba gear because I don't know if you can survive this one. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to read from verse 20 to verse 21. And let me preempt it by saying this. Now, remember what I told you earlier. All cultures have different festivals that they do. We here in the Bahamas, our culture in terms of festival is the Junkanoo, which we inherited from ancestral Africa. Uh, in uh, Brazil and other places, they have the Carnival, and in the Caribbean they have Bacchanal and all these other things. Now, to, to add to what I'm saying to you, like I told you, the beating of the drums, while you may think it's entertainment, and while those that are beating of the drums are thinking it's entertainment, this is how they summon the spirits. But they're not aware of this. There were certain beats that would start off very, very slow. And people that know, I remember one time uh, there was a, a Haitian family that I knew. 
and they would have little festivals outside of their their home right on the front part of the home where you could see them beating the drums and i mean the people would just go off like in a trance dropping on the dirt and rolling over and doing all those other stuff then they would have these altars or these little tables and on the table they'd have different bottles of alcoholic beverages little bowls with eggs and stuff now, what is this well this is the altar okay and the things that are on this altar are what pleases the spirits so once the guy is over here beating 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 and everybody dung 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 then you, you finally see where if it's a female she'll bend back eyes roll over at this point the spirit had entered her okay and will come over to the the table now watch this now watch how deep this is on this table that all depends on what this ritual is about is this to send curses at this at someone is this to worship the spirits because each setting up of the altar will have different reasons but each altar has a spirit that's sponsoring that altar so if there are photos of people there or you will see something like a belt or a watch or whatever this isn't what the spirit want no these items are here so that this these are personal items from whomever so because spirits are not omnipresent these are the identifiers to let the spirit know who, who they're specifically being projected at i'll give you an example you will probably be in america somewhere or timbuktu you're sitting down watching tv and you smell this strong alcohol liquor smell why am i smelling this there's nobody here i can guarantee you at that altar a part of the ritual the practitioners will begin to put the alcohol in their mouth and now spit it out over the altar that spirit now will masquerade that I don't, if that person is in china that person is going to smell it or they would have a cigar and take a long draw and blow it over the altar and that person no matter where they are is going to smell it somebody listen to me you all know what i'm talking about right now because i know you all would have experienced it at some point so you see the correlation now they are following the rituals they are coming in agreement with what the spirits want to invite the spirits to do their bidding here is where it becomes masquerading now the spirits that they're sending behind you or sending to you in the spiritual realm they're gonna come but now they're gonna come masquerading they're gonna come for the most part as your deceased mother your deceased father that's why I tell you over and over dreaming of the deceased are the worst dreams you could ever have because what you are seeing are not your loved ones these are masquerading spirits they are hiding behind the images of people that you're familiar with all in an effort to gain your trust once they get that and you begin to interact with them you don't notice but you're forging a covenant spiritually so whatever the spirit behind the masquerade represent that is what you're coming in covenant with many people have uh, come in agreement with sickness spiritual sickness and didn't know they didn't know it but if you go back to the dream if you go back to the dream it, you, you will you will trace it right back there so all of that stuff when you wake up in the morning and stuff you see scratches on you somebody was at the altar somebody was at the altar and they were sending spirits at you why is this you hear a voice calling you in your home everybody's asleep Mary, Mary, who oh, know me and you and everybody sleep or oh, nobody is at home, only you. Spirits from the altar, spirits from, they are projecting spirits from the altar. Now, here is where the church dropped the ball, all right? This is where they dropped the ball. Now, they cuss me all the time and they cuss me because they are ignorant and they, I show them up all the time. Had the church been training you like they were supposed to, like in my last teaching, then the church would have told you what I started out with in my teaching. They would have been teaching you when these things are happening, you're not going crazy, but more so, rather than to check or test your sanity, they would have taught you what I've been teaching you all along. How do I deploy my angels? How, how do I put my angels to work to combat this voice would just call me? This cigarette smell, this, these strange phenomena happening. In my, why at night I hear all of this cracking in my roof? Huh? Why do I hear like footsteps in my home or I feel this presence coming in the room like something pressing my bed down or something holding me down and then I cannot talk. What do I do? What is my resources? What do I, you don't know what to do because they don't teach you what to do. 
But the Bible said, I read it for you earlier. The Bible is clear. The Bible said in Psalms 103 verse 20, Oh, how excellent are the angels in their strength. Huh? Who hearken unto the voice of his word. So the angels are right there. They see the spirits too. But they say, Kev, we can't do nothing unless you speak the word of God. Kev, Kev, please say something. We want to fight for you. We want to shut. In fact, we wanted to stop them from coming in here. But Kev, you're sleeping when God was telling you get up at 3 o'clock to go and pray. Kev, you're sleeping when God was telling you get up at 2 o'clock to go and pray now. Because they're at the altars now projecting curses at you. But you listen to these people talking for you, but these things ain't real. You know what's real while you listen to them. Speak the word of God. Father God, your word declares that you have given your angels charge over me. Right now in the realm of the spirit, I dispatch them according to the word of God by first saying there's absolutely no weapon that has been formed against me. Shall prosper. Your word is clear, Father God. And you said that any tongue that has risen up against me in judgment, I condemn it. So that means whatever they're saying at that altar against me, that is being, they are, they are saying things against me in judgment. So God says, I am not going to condemn it for you. No, 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 no. I gave you that power. Now work it. Work it for me right now. Okay, God, I can work this right now. Anyone from any altar sending any curses, any hexes, any spell against me, against my family, I condemn it in the name of Jesus. Now the angels got to go. You all hear that, right? Let's go, Michael, the minister of defense. You all, let's go. Shut this baby down right now. But you see, they cannot move if you listen to what these preachers telling you. Not all of them. If they, if they, if they tell in, see, this is why I say to you over and over, and I know you're all tired of me saying it, but I can never stop saying it until you'll get it. Giving the preacher money cannot stop spirits. Listen, any preacher that says to you, you got to pay for deliverance. You got to pray for them, pay for, for them to pray for you. You got to pay... That's a voodoo worker because that is what voodoo workers do. You pay the spirits. Why are you giving the money to them? The truth is this is what they pay the spirits with. Now, the truth is the spirit can spend the money. What the reality is of that transaction is you coming in covenant, meaning that we're going to pay you, but you don't understand what this transaction means. This means that you agreeing what we're doing here. You're giving us the right to come from the spiritual world into your world and to work our wickedness. What they don't know, though, is that the same wickedness you come into this altar to work for Peter over here. You know what they're saying? You don't read the law. You didn't read the law that says, uh, whatsoever evil a man do, that same evil shall be returned to him. You think the spirits can remind you about that? No. So why are you here working this half a piece of, half a pound of old on Kevin? We can do this to Kevin and mess up his marriage and mess up his home. Oh, that's what you can do. Eh? But they're not telling you the fine print that the same thing you come to this altar to do to someone you are at the same time signing on the dotted line for it to be done to you. But they're not going to tell you that. Why? Like I've been telling you in all of my teachings, evil spirits, voodoo practitioners, particularly demon, demonic forces, evil spirits, they have no loyalty to mankind. And why should they if they are condemned to a Christless hell at the end of the day? Why should they? These are the things that you need to know. These are the things that you need to know to overcome the evil that's coming at you. Let me put it this way. The things that is happening to you physically in your life, all it is is, an, is evidence that you behind the eight ball. Because if it's already manifested, then that is clear evidence that was already conceived in the spiritual realm. It is already followed and got the, the required approvals, more than likely from you and you don't even know. So now it's manifesting itself in your life. Excuse me. So I hope I ain't going too fast for you. Let me take my time. If I, if I, if I take him too long, you can tell me right now, Kevin, I'm ready to go sleep and I'll stop right now. But you know that ain't going to happen, right? <laughs> so anyway, once we understand the principles behind these things, now we understand. So, so when, we go, when we go to, remember the story in Numbers 23 or Numbers 22, when Balak, uh, uh, sorry, Balaam, the king of the Moabites, had summoned Balaam, the Obia man, to come and curse Israel down in the valley. Remember, they were up on, uh, on the mountain of uh, Bel Peor. But what did, what, did, what, did Balaam, what did Balaam tell Balak when he first got there to work this voodoo? Because it can't be done without an altar. What did he say? Set up seven altars for me. Read it. It read in the scriptures. He says, set up seven altars. And not just set up seven altars. He said, now make a sacrifice. Get the, the bull, get the whatever. And to each altar, make the sacrifice. Why is this? Because this is how you initiate calling the spirits. But what did I also tell you? Those spirits, no matter how powerful they are, have zero effect on your life 
if you are doing the word of the living God, if you are following the rules, they can call up uh, uh, Kali from the Indian desert, the destroying spirit. Kali got to stand up and look and observe and say, buddy, ain't nothing we can do here. This poison living right. This poison is in righteousness. This poison is living in repentance. This poison is following the rules of God. So this is why I say to people, when you come to me and say, Kevin, I think they will got peace of Obia on me. My next question to you is, what is it going on in your life that is causing this piece of Obia to work in your life? Because it just can't come like that. When you understand the rules, you would know very quickly that it just don't happen that way. What is going on? Don't say, Kevin, I walk on something. I don't, you gotta walk on crocodiles. If your life is lined up, and when I say line up, particularly if there's no hate, no bitterness, no unforgiveness, no pettiness in your life, none of that, you're waiting to get somebody. Because all of that there is ground for forces to break through the hedge of protection that is around every believer. And the only way that hedge of protection, according to Job 1 verse 10, is tampered with is when the believer is living in unconfessed sin, sin that he or she did not repent about. Why? Because the minute you repent, you stop the execution orders of the kingdom of heaven, so of, of, of hell, the, the kingdom of darkness, from executing the legal right they had to execute on you. But when you say, Lord, forgive me, it shut it down in the spiritual realm. How do you know this, Kevin? Because the scriptures are clear. God says, listen, when I forgive you, here's what I do. I take this incident, I take this sin, and now I'm going to fling this into the sea of forgetfulness. I even remember, so Satan can't even come here no more, because I don't even remember what you, what he, what he, what he coming to charge you with, when I done shut this down. Second of all, in 1 John uh, 1 and 9, and again, these are all rules, this ain't just scriptures on, on paper, these are the rules of the spiritual realm. 1 John 1 and 9, what did God say? He said, listen, if you confess your sin, and only if you confess it, because I can't confess it for you. God at us. If, if you confess your sin, he says, I'm going to promise you this. That's my rule. That's my law. That's my word. He says, if you confess your sin, I am faithful and just to forgive you of that sin. But I'm not just going to do that. To make sure Satan have no legal ground in your life, I'm going to do something you didn't even ask me to do. I'm going to forgive the sin. Now I'm going to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So there are things that was going on with you that... Whether you recall it or not, I'm going to just so that the enemy would not have legal ground, I'm going to move all of this out of your life. So, what am I saying to you in a nutshell? If you don't know the rules, you are playing church. If you don't know the rules, you are getting a good workout in church. If you don't know the rules, you will tell me everything which your pastor say, but never what the scripture says to me. You need to know the rules. Any, any, I'm looking at uh, Miss Williams on here, right? The, the designer lady. Now, she designs clothes. She don't just go pick up a piece of something and just start sewing it together. She will tell you there are rules that she has to follow. How to cut the pattern, what type of material to use, what type of thread and needle. You don't just go there and do what you want to do. Everything is governed by a rule. Everything is governed by a law. Everything is governed by a principle. Every system needs those things to make it function. It just don't function because it could function. There are laws, there are principles, there are the, 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 the kingdom, the spiritual world is no different. I'm telling you, you will be better Christians. You will be more effective. You are definitely going to see more signs and wonders in your life when not only do you know the rules, but when you begin to participate in those rules. But just saying hallelujah, amen, preaching pastor, you go to church because this is what you do and you want everybody to know that the church don't open, man, don't, don't ever go whatever without seeing you. That isn't going to change it. That is no credit to you. Credit is what is the results of you doing that. What is the result that I get up to go to work every day or you get up to go to work every day? The result is I expect a paycheck at the end of my month or the end of the week or every bi-week, right? So therefore, there are rules and the rules must bring a result when you follow them. So if I'm on this person's job and I'm following all the rules that are required of me, then I must see my paycheck at the end of the day. If, if, if Miss Williams here who went to school to learn how to do these things, when she come back, she ain't coming back and putting anything together. She, when she tell her staff, this is how you do it. What is she really doing? She's telling them to follow this specific rule to get that same result we see up there on that picture. 
but the church has trained you to circumvent the rules. How, Kevin? By telling you, you could bribe God. Because that's what it is. God, look here. I ain't into no fasting, man. Talking. I ain't got time for that, man. Let me give you a slow thousand, God. Fix this thing for your boy. That's what you're saying. That's what, that's what they're telling you. They're telling you to pimp God. When they tell you, give God money and you can get a healing. When they tell you, when they charge you $600 for a deliverance. When your Jesus did it for free, they are telling you, I got a quicker lane to get to God. You don't got to go through all of that. So this is what you're doing when you're following these things that have nothing to do with God. All right? So let's get back here. So we see so far here that masquerading spirits will pop up in our dreams. And many of you have had such dreams where, especially with guys, young guys, a lot of young men, especially when they reach puberty stages, they don't realize that masquerading spirits are in their dreams. And it comes to them as these beautiful women. So here it is there in the dream, I mean, just having sex, right? T to the extent, watch this, they literally ejaculate in the dream, which they call wet dreams. Now, what they don't know is that their spirit is having sex with spirit, with, another, with an evil spirit. It is so intense that it's physically being manifested in their body where they're literally discharging in the dream. At that point, that spirit entered. I, I want you all to listen to me because I, I can give you the scriptures for it right now. At that point, the spirit entered them. Now, they don't realize this, but you know who can realize it? The parents. And how are they going to realize it? Depending on the spirit that has entered them, and for the most part, it will be a spirit of rebellion. That child is going to be very disobedient to that parent. That child is going to be so defiant to laws and rules and authority. But then you, you're going to be confused. Why, why this happening? Why Johnny doing this? Now, in your mind, you're looking at things natural. Boy... I, that's why, why you think I didn't want Johnny hanging around married children? He ain't got nothing to do with married children, sweetie. He ain't got nothing to do with married children. This is, in fact, married children only get maintained what was already there. Your young daughters, especially watching pornography and stuff, listen, spirits are entering. And it ain't probably entering them. When you see them fall to sleep at night, you hear me? Those spirits are coming now. And they're coming masquerading as what they saw on that computer, what they saw on that tablet, what they saw on that phone, what they saw on the TV. And of course, when they uh, hook up with these things in the dream, which is really the spiritual realm, a covenant is for, for it. What happens now? The young lady becomes pr promiscuous, anxious to have a boyfriend, anxious to have sex, putting on rouge, you know what they call it? Makeup one. All of a sudden, she want to act grown. Now, the parent again, based on their limited five senses, is going to reduce what's happening here to something physical. Because she said, now, she probably got a boyfriend in school. She ain't studying or working. She, she, yeah, that may be true, but that's just, what you, what you talking about is the after effect. What I'm talking about is what has spiritually transpired that you have no knowledge of. Even though you go to church every Sunday, even though you do every Bible study, even though you do every conclave, and still ain't learning nothing. And these are the things that are missing. So let's prove this now. Let's prove this. Let's go, like I said, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. Remember I told you about the altar? Remember I told you what they do at the altar, right? Remember I told you every spirit is at an altar. And depending on the ritual that they are doing, is conjuring up a specific spirit. Whether it's a tormenting spirit, whether it's a spirit of insanity, whether it's a spirit of poverty, whether it's a spirit of setback, delays, and all of this will be manifested in your dreams, which we will get to in a little bit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's read verse 20. Paul again speaking to the church of Corinth. But I say... That the things which the Gentile sacrifice, okay? So the wickedness, the voodoo they're doing, the witchcraft, the Sangoa, the, the Santeria, the whatever they're doing. They're making sacrifices to their gods. This ain't no sacrifice to, 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 to God, the God of Abraham. Excuse me. The things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice, listen to this carefully, to who? To devils. Do you hear this? Read it. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 20, Paul has given some major spiritual insight here. Anyone who's practicing sorcery, anyone who's into Freemason, anyone who's into Eastern Star, anyone who's into any secret societies, and they have to make uh, uh, pledges and, and, 
and make all of these oaths and agreements. Who, listen, the only thing you need to know, who are you making them to? Are you making them to the God of Abraham? Because the minute you know, well, according to Paul, not Kevin, according to Paul, you are making them to devils. You don't got to believe me? Go read the scripture. You don't got to agree with me? I don't care if you don't agree with me, because I agree with the scripture. Go read the scripture. Go and read the scripture. Okay, so when your uncle and them tell you he's a grand master flash mason and wearing the apron and all that, yeah, that's beautiful. And they look like they're very excellent humanitarian people. No, 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 buddy. Let's go to the history. Let's go to the core. Who are you making agreements with? Because that's a whole new can of worms you can open now. Because whomever deity you are making pledges to, especially, Mr. Mason, and I hope you're listening to me right now, especially when they told you to read that oath, and somehow you see your children name in there, that if you ever reveal the secret, look at all of these horrible things that they say will happen to your family. Hello? Then all of a sudden you realize, Mason man, your wife riddled with cancer, your daughter riddled with cancer. Look at all of these tragedies that's happening to you, but you will never connect it to that because you don't understand spiritual laws. You all better get together. Get it together. Get it together. I bring in your wisdom tonight. Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. It's totally up to you. I don't care what you do with it. Take it or leave it. So Paul is very clear here in verse 20. He says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to who? Devils. They sacrifice the devils. Can I go a little bit deeper, please? Can I go just a little bit deeper, please? Because I'm going to bring some stuff home right now. Can I go? Y'all ready for this? Forget the Masons right now. Because we know they're in the... The matter of fact, they, they call it the secret society. We know they're up to no good. But let's bring this baby home. Can I bring this home, please? All right? Can I bring this home? A lot of you right now, stuck in life. You're 35, 25, 45, 50, 60, 65. Ain't going nowhere. Lock, stock, and barrel. Man and woman. Yes, you're all of your peers running past you in life. In fact, their grandchildren doing better than you. You safe. You've been safe. You so safe that safe written all over you. But you're the only person safe who broke, busted, disgusted, cannot be trusted, and somewhere in the corner eating custard. <laughs> Ain't nothing happening for you. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? How come I can't get ahead? Well, let's look at agreements that you never thought were agreements. You remember when you had some issues in your life, some sickness that was strange, and mommy or daddy took you somewhere. And this person gave you a spiritual bath. You remember that? When they had you naked yourself. And this little basin or tub, or they would have did it, they would have done it by the ocean or by some body of water. And they would rub you down with this stuff. Now, whatever you had, more than likely would have dissipated. But the reality is, they were moving one spirit and bringing a greater spirit on board. How, how do you notice, Mr. Ewing? I can tell you right now. From that day forward, let's say you were 20, 50, let's say you were 50 and then, nothing never went right for you. Why? Why? And I didn't want to bring this up because it's kind of, it's kind of getting into my, my final teaching on changing your destiny because it's have a lot to do with it. Why though? You see, when they perf listen, you're only listening, you know, when they perform that ritual, see the ritual isn't just, oh, oh the woman just bade me. So, the woman say, you know, no evil can happen to me. I don't care much witchcraft. They will come me. Mom, mom, sir, what they did to you, it, it would have been better if the witchcraft did work on you. Th that's how, because what you did is you, 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 you surrendered. You say, hey, this destiny that God gave me, I don't want this. Come change it. So the spiritual bad, what do they do? Remember, whatever they are doing, they're not pulling things out of a hat. Whatever it is that they're doing, this is the requirement of the spirit behind the altar. This is what's going to give them the right to not only infiltrate your life, but to dominate your life. Now, why am I bringing all of this up? Let's finish the scripture first and I can tell you why. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 10, he says, 
But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, got nothing to do with God. And not to God, he made that clear. And I would not that you should have fellowship with who? Devils. Listen to verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord. You cannot be a Freemason and talking nonsense, but you was an apostle or you was a bishop or you was a pastor. That's what he's saying here. Let's cut, just cut through the chase. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be a partaker of the Lord table and the table of devils. Read it. I didn't write that. Go and read it. Now, let me get to my point. You ready for this? You better sit down because this is going to affect all of you all right now. <laughs> okay, you I hope you're ready for this. Remember what we just said now. He's telling you, don't have no affiliations with these things. Sorcery, superstition, tarot card. He say all of these things are just different portals for dragging you to a place you don't need to be. He's making this clear in the scripture. Why? But what did he say? He says the sacrifices that they're doing at these altars. He said, not because you don't see a spirit there. That meaning no spirit there. He said, not only is it a spirit, he identified the spirit. He said, it is a devil. It is devils. That's what he said. Now, what happens now? Let's go back to the spiritual bad. Let's go back to the spiritual bad. That's number one. Because you, whoever done it, your life on lock. Let me tell you that right now. But I can tell you how to get out though. For you mothers who have been advised more than likely by your parents or Grammy that when you would have had your baby to tell the doctor save the afterbirth in a bath, in a plastic bag, whatever, because you now were advised to go and bury it. Why? Did you have a question why they asked you to do that? They, they tell you that this is going to protect the child from the spirits. What spirits? So the, the Bible don't exist no more. The blood of Jesus doesn't exist no more. And Christians are doing this. But they're ignorant. They're, they're, they're taking... What did Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 15 verse 6, I think it is, 5 or 6. He said, listen. He said, it is because of your tradition, the word of God has no effect. So that means, God, I pray every day for you to break the spirit of poverty. God, I pray every day I can't get married and nobody, no man, want me. God, I pray to be a good husband, nobody will marry me. Oh, maybe because you made a covenant. Maybe someone made a covenant. Maybe your parent got your navel string buried somewhere. Hello? And you didn't know it was a covenant that was made between you and that altar and the devils behind that altar. And it is those devils that are pulling the strings to your physical life, ensuring that you don't ever, ever, ever succeed in life. Set limitations and restrictions on your life spiritually. As a result of it, you cannot go forward physically. I, I can shut this baby down tonight. I shut this down tonight. I hear none of y'all tonight. Listen, this is the information you're missing. Your whole life was robbed from you because you did not know the rules you did not know the spiritual implication your parents were ignorant when they followed the traditions of the ancestors that lock your life up and you didn't even know i hope you're listening to me that child whose navel string is buried if it, if, if that child is still living today if you need to pray and ask God not only to forgive your father, I break the covenant that I made with that altar by the tree. Father, what I did to my child, I didn't know better. But Kevin telling me different now. I didn't, didn't nobody tell me this, Jesus. Father, forgive me. I repent of what I did to Pookie, Lord. That's why Pookie life never got together. That's why Pookie on his third divorce. That's why Pookie was shot when he was 16. That's why everything Pookie put his hand to, it could never ever succeed. Because I didn't know. When I buried his the afterbirth, I was following a ritual that I didn't know that was inviting the devils of an altar to, to, to take over his life. They now pull the strings to his life. Same devils when Elijah said, listen, listen to me carefully, boy. There are more invisible angels that are here than the devils that are influencing the Syrian army. I hope you all listen to me. I hope you all listen to me. I hope you're all listening to me tonight. This is what you need to hear. You need to hear this. They don't tell you all day that Jesus can bless you. They don't tell you all day the blessing around the corner, right? They don't tell you it's going to be a shift in the atmosphere, but this is the shift radio. This is the shift right here, okay? This is the shift you've been looking for. This is it right here. I'm telling you, whatever they advise you to do, 
Whatever your Grammy told you, when you couldn't have children, what did your Grammy mix? What did they do? What did they tell you to drink? And out of their ignorance, you did it. You did it. But you didn't know you was forging a covenant with the altars in which that consultation came from. You didn't know that. She didn't even know that. Why? Because it was a tradition handed down from generation to generation to generation. But Jesus made the rule very clear, the spiritual law. He said it's because of your tradition, because of these cultural practices that you have yet to question. It has caused my word, not that my word isn't powerful, but it has caused my word to be of no effect in your life. Uh-huh. That's why you can't go forward. But the day you break the covenant between you and that altar, the day you break the covenant between you and that spiritual bath, the day you, when they tell you to go down by the beach and dip seven times in the night, what kind of gangster move this is? Why you got to go there in the night? Huh? Why you got to go there in the night? All of this you should have been asking. I don't, what I keep telling you, I don't care what they call themselves, prophet, apostle, third degree, whatever, it don't matter. If that title isn't producing the fruit, we got a problem. He said, you will know them, but why are you saying that you are an apostle of God, but you are practicing sorcery? Why are you resorting to omens and you are a bishop? Why are you telling me to sprinkle salt in my house to stop the spirits from coming? Why are you telling me to mop my floor with type and time? Why aren't you telling me to call on the Jesus that I taught you were serving? Why didn't you tell me plead the blood of Jesus? Why didn't you tell me speak the word of God to employ and deploy the angelic hosts who are right here waiting to fight for me? But even though they are here, you are asking me to source evil powers. Get out of here. Obey Waker, get out of here. You witchcraft Waker, get out of here. Your titles don't fool Kevin. I study this long enough to know you from a mile away. You fool the rest of them, but you ain't gonna fool Kevin. Huh? Want me to go deeper for you? Do you want me to go deeper? Let me hear you. Do you do you want me to go deeper? Because I will save some of this. Let me look. Let me see. You want me to go deeper? Come on now. Okay, you won't go deeper? Yes, I will go deeper. I want me to go deeper. Why is that preacher? Every time they come to prophesy, every time they come to preach, they got a red item with them. Why they got a red cloth with them? Why they got a red hoodie with them? Why they got a red towel with them? Oh, you don't know, eh? You don't know that the arrangement that they would have made with the altar, that they were given a command that there is a certain item that you need to have, okay? So that the spirits will identify who and where you are to come and perform fake miracles. Oh, you didn't know that. You don't know that. You don't know that. You're running behind them. Poof, poof. <laughs> out, out. Oh, you didn't know that. See, I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to go there, but you, you forced me. See, because I can't, I tired. I just tired of watching the people of God who do not have the spirit of discernment to see these devils just raping their lives. The limited time that they have here on earth, these people are exchanging their destinies and they don't even know. They don't even know. They have no idea. They have zero idea. You all watching this? Are you all seeing how these people are just dismissing the word of God? You notice? Watch them in their services. They're always with a red piece. Of, remember I tell you all, before COVID-19 come, right? I was supposed to, where my book is? There was a book that I tell you that I was starting a series called Church Mafia with the African guy who, he, he's a pastor now, but he, he went into the occult to get powers, right? Now, now what he wrote in the book, I had already known, but I just wanted to see his version of it. And he was talking about when they go to the witch doctors, that there are certain things that they have to bury on the church property, whether it be, uh, excuse me, human bones or certain things. Then there were certain things that, like a certain perfume that they would put on them, or more than likely, for the most part, you would always see them with a certain cloth, particularly red or white. The purpose of this, the purpose of this is so that this, see, once you, hear me again, in order for the spiritual realm to work for you, there have to be an agreement. So the spirits, I will do it for you. I will, I will, I will, I will perform all those fake miracles for you, but, but you need to. After everything I said and tell you do, the things you don't bury on the church property, the things you don't gotta need the seed around here, now I need you to keep this cloth right here, keep this cloth on you. And everywhere you go. And you take it. Y'all know what they talking about, right? Y'all know what they talking about, right? Okay then. Poof, poof. 
all they're doing is spitting all kind of demons on you. Remember what I told you. Witchcraft cannot happen outside of an altar. Why? Because the altar is where humanity meets with spirits, beings, deities. To what? Forge agreements, but primarily to do what? To change the destiny of people. Now you may say, well, Kev, why are they doing that? That don't make no sense. Why would you do that to somebody? No, to you it don't make no sense. But you see, in order for them to increase in their power, and not really no power that they have, increase in power means they will have more evil spirits assigned to them to do even greater evil. So to do that, just like how the kingdom of God, we are to recruit souls for the kingdom of God, well, they are to recruit souls for the kingdom of darkness. So they put up this big facade as if this is of God. This is the house of God. But you watch, if, if, you, if you do what I'm telling you to do, if you go by the word of God, which is the benchmark, you will see, you will see that this ain't lining up. You will see that that church and that title is not producing the fruit according to the scriptures. And that's why I keep saying to you, you will know them by their fruit. Not who they say they are, not who they claim to be, not by their prophecy, not by deliverance, not by spinning around, not by huff, huff, puff, puff, spin around, send around, none of that. No. Why aren't you following the rules? Why aren't you using, why am I not hearing you using in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? You're just saying in the name of Jesus. Didn't Paul say, even if they come to you, listen, preaching another Jesus. I ain't gonna go there tonight. That's a whole new, I ain't gonna go there tonight. But I'm trying to get you because... There's so many people out there who are really hungry for the word of God. They are hungry. They are literally, literally hungry. And I see it every day. However, you don't have much people who understand the scriptures in terms of its principles and laws. So what happens is anyone that comes along that, that, that say anything to them, Oh, the Lord has shown me that, that, that things are difficult in your life. There's some things difficult in all our life. That ain't nothing special. Oh my God, you are, you only God can tell you this. Yeah, and God say, uh, oh hallelujah, God say, if you so, so, so $50 to the prophet right now, that God says he's going to turn around. But if you don't do it, God is going to drive everything else in your life. <laughs> you hear that? You, you, you hear this, this robber? You will know them by their fruit. You want to listen to me? You will know them. You know, I, listen, if you, if you don't get nothing else I say tonight, you will know them by their fruit. Stop. I always just use me. Don't mind Kevin with all of this so-called knowledge and wisdom and all of that. Let's look at his fruit. Let's look at, okay, let's go on YouTube. Let's look at his platforms where people could comment. Now, let's read what they're saying. Because if he claimed to know all these things and he claimed to have the remedy that would get these spirits out of you, well, then I should see somebody, someone should say, Man of God, I did what you say, and this happened. I should see that, right? Now, you see it, right? <laughs> okay, I don't know these people. All they did, just like you, they're watching me, and they're not following me. They're following the laws, the rules, the principles that operate the system of the spiritual realm to change things initially in the invisible world that will guarantee change in the physical world. So now when you go, go. You read the comments. Ain't no glory to Kevin. Because they're doing exactly what I did to get where I am today. Because I used to be broke. I used to be, my place used to be infested with demons. Spirits harassing me all night, scorching me up, calling my name, shaking my bed. And when I tell the pastors this, they look at me like this nigga here, ain't no good. But I thank God for them. You know why I thank God for them? Because had I listened to them, had I listened to them, I would have not and go and search the scriptures for myself. And find these revelations, the mysteries that was holding the strings, pulling the strings in my life. So I thank God for every last one of them that disappointed me. I give God the glory for y'all. And that's why I say to y'all all the time, I don't stand on the soldiers, like no, no shoulders or no pastors. And that's no disrespect to them. I stand on the shoulders of my haters because it's the, the evil that they did that forced me to look. They got to be, the, the, the power of God got to be greater than this invisible evil. And through my, the fasting that I always tell you to do, the Lord revealed the answers to me. So I'm telling you right now, you, you, you got to take that road. So, as you can see here, the altar, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 20 to 21, he says when, you, when they're doing the sacrifice, when they're doing the rituals, when they're doing the ceremony, when they're doing the beating of the drums, when they tell you mop your floor with type and time, when they tell you when the, little, the child's screaming all night, they say put the black string around the child's arm. What does that mean, Mr. Ewing? They're so ignorant. 
or what, what, what they are, listen to me, masquerading spirits is what? It's all about deception. The very thing that they're telling you to do to ward off spirits is what is giving the spirits the green light to come into your life. Yeah. You remember that? The child waking up screaming at night, ah, 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 ah. They go running the and mind you, they don't know what they're doing, you know, but this is a tradition. So they go and put the thing around the child. The child's still screaming, but they committed to the tradition. All them scriptures in the Bible, they can pray over the child. All that gallon of olive oil and stuff they got there to, to anoint the child with. No, 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 no. Let's go follow the tradition. And what they don't know, they just open up a portal. Spirits are now just being directed to this child life and watch the behavior of the child. How do we know it's witchcraft on them when they do it? Well, let's go back to the principles. What does the principle say? The principle said in, uh, I think, 1 Samuel 15. Uh, I can't remember the exact uh, verse, but you, you will know it. When uh, Samuel confronted Saul, the king, because he did not follow the instructions to annihilate the entirety of the Amalekites. And he said to him, he said, your rebellion, not doing the word of God, your rebellion in doing something else other than the word of God. You didn't pray for the child. You put the string around the child. You didn't walk through the house and anoint it with olive oil and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to run the spirits. What you did is you followed that man and he said, put salt in the corner of your place or mop the floor with, with, with turpentine or, or walk out to the front gate and walk backward into the house or get graveyard dust and do a bunch of food. So you did, you're not following the word of God, you're following the rules and the regulations of evil altars. As a result of that, the, the rulers, he says, because of your rebellion, not doing it God's way, your rebellion is like the spirit of witchcraft. That's what he says. So you don't re, you, you, you work in witchcraft on your child and you don't even know. You see what ignorance is doing to you? You see why I tell you, listen, what the word, what is the law, what does the law of destruction say again? The law of destruction says that we perish because of a lack of knowledge. What is the law of captivity? What is captivity? Meaning that I can't go forward in life. What does that law say? Isaiah uh, 5 verse 13. It says, my people are gone into captivity, spiritual imprisonment. Because that's a spirit realm is where everything takes place. If you're locked down there, it is automatic that you will be locked down physically. My people are going into to captivity. Say, my people are going into your yeah, captivity. Why? Because they lack knowledge. They don't know what I'm telling you right now. So they, they keep following this pattern over. They don't realize that that thing when you were building your house and mama was saved for at least 6,000 years. Child, come here. I can tell you this right now, child. People around here are wicked. Meaning her too. People around here are wicked. Nobody to do. You see this here? Go mix this, do this, and bury this in your foundation. Get a Bible and make sure they put that in that foundation. They can't touch you. Yeah, mama. How come you tell me about Jesus, mama? How come you tell me plead the blood of Jesus around here? I, I confuse here. You ain't telling me nothing but Jesus. You telling me. See, mama, and, and to her credit, more than likely, she's taking on the baton of ignorance that was handed to her. And to be honest with you, let's be fair about it now. You know, back then, you don't question your elders. So if mama telling you to do this, mama told this big Bible to church all her life. As far as you're concerned, mama know what she's talking about. So you can follow what mama say. Huh? When mama tell you, now listen, uh, I, I see you with that boy. Okay, and I, I notice you don't sleep home. But child, listen to me. Don't leave your panties and stuff. You don't leave your clothes there. You don't know how these people go. Yeah, mama, now hold on. The scripture tell me so, man, think it's so. See, son, I like used to be doing these things. <laughs> okay. Don't leave your clothes there because people they take your clothes and, and fix you, you know. Where are they getting these things from? Where are they getting this from? Let me tell you something, yeah. This spiritual warfare, when it comes to witchcraft, and, and especially in the Caribbean, all over the world, but especially in this Caribbean, I did this, this worse than any nuclear war. See, because the nuclear war, you could see the missiles coming. Nuclear war, you could see the, 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 the big explosion in the, side, in the sky. When they set in spirits, and you don't see that. You feel the effects of it. But you don't see that. So all those things they were telling you, huh? Mama tell you. Listen to this now. Let me, let me, let me. You know, I don't go here tonight because I was, I doing the part two of this, you know. But I, and I kind of jumped ahead of myself. I was so anxious. Here it is. A man is in, in bed having sex with a woman. And she has a penny under her tongue. And she's sucking this penny. He's a married man now. This is a side piece but she won him permanently. 
So the Sangomas or the witch doctors advise her, this was the consultation, get a penny, put it under your tongue, and while he is having sex with you, you suck on this penny, and he ain't going nowhere. And through the form, it happens. But why is it happening? Let's go back to the scripture. Do not have no affiliations with the Gentiles in their sacrifice. Why? Because they are sacrificing. What are they sacrificing at the altars with all these things? But just look like foolishness. But what look like foolishness? There are spirits behind that. So what happens now? Through her ritual, there are spirits that she's releasing on him. But he is in agreement with this because he's having sex with her. So what happens now? The spirits, remember the teaching I did when I talk about uh, uh, Jehoshaphat, Ahab, and the prophet uh, Micaiah, when he said he had a vision and he saw God sitting on his throne with the host of heaven next to him. And he said, which one of your spirits will go and, and persuade uh, the prophets of Baal? And one spirit said, no, me, no, 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 not me, no, 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 not you. And one spirit came before and said, I will do it. And God says, how will you do this? He's talking to the spirit now. He says, I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. But the revelation in the story here is that spirits influence people. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Some guy listening to me right now. You've been here before. You were seeing this girl, whether she was your side piece or whether she was your girlfriend. And before, you never had a jealous spirit on you. It was never like that. And all of a sudden, like, you just can't stop thinking about her. Like, you're just so obsessed with her. Huh? You jumping in your car at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, cycling around the house to make sure she's home. You stalking on the bush like some uh, private detective. Why are you doing this and you never, would, this was happening before? The question you should ask is, what has happened spiritually that is causing you to perform this way physically? See, you can run from this all you want. The reality is reality. No. Where do you, see, this is what I love about the spiritual world. Whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. I hear people say all the time, Ignorant people, of course. Oh, witchcraft can't work on you unless you believe in it. Really? Uh, show me that scripture again. Show me, show me the law. That, that's the, other than your opinion, show me the actual biblical law. Because I want to see it. Because all I've been giving you is laws tonight. So show me your law. Not your hypothesis. Not your theory. Not what you feel or believe or where your dumb mind taking you. Show me the rules. So she's sucking on this penny. And this dude can't go nowhere. Lose his entire desire for his wife. Why? Because she performed a ritual that the spirits from the altars told the practitioner of that altar, which is the witch doctor, and said, if you want to keep this man, this is what you do. Now, the only problem with that is she has to renew that ritual every so often to keep him. Because the day she do not do the ritual, she not follow up on it, he's going to come back to his senses. The spirits are going to stop working in her favor. And he's going to, he's going to, well, in fact, while he's, she's even doing that, he's the most miserable person ever. Why? Because he don't understand why he's this way. He want to be home with his family. He really want to be there. But there's something keeping him here. His wife is begging and crying, honey, please, can just come pay for this. You don't got to come home. Just come spend some time with little Johnny. F you, F Johnny, F everybody, cuss all of them out. But when he get back to his sweet house, he miserable. Why is he miserable? Because there's an evil force that's been assigned to his life through the ritual that she has performed via the consultation of the altars. I hope you all listening to me tonight. I really hope you all listening to me tonight. I really, really hope. So much masquerading spirits and sorcery is taking place in our country, in particular the church. The church the building. That's why a lot of them can't wait to get back there to resume the evil practices that they've been doing under the guise of Christianity. And if you spend the rest of your life playing church, you are the, the devil is literally robbing you of your destiny. Literally. You will never become what you're supposed to be if you follow their rituals. If you follow the things that they're telling you to do outside of the word of God. I told you before I had a lady that came to me one time and the reason why she came based, based on a teaching I was doing on omens and she wanted to share with me how she went to her pastor well not her pastor but a well-known pastor and she was telling him the strange things that it was happening in her home he advised her this was a pastor now this listen to the pastor tell her to go and put salt in the four corners of her house not quote the word of God so that the angels of the Lord could be deployed and employed and fight on your behalf. Not plead the blood of Jesus. Not cover yourself in the whole armor of God. None of that. None of those available resources. What he's telling her to do is forget God. Forget God. Go straight to witchcraft. Go straight to the kingdom of darkness and uh, get their resources to work with. That's what, that's what they're telling you to do. 
So for those of you who have buried your navel strings, your children's navel string, or your navel string was buried, for those of you who have done certain rituals to get that man to fall in love with you or to get that woman to fall in love with you, or you have did certain spells to get a job, whatever you have done where you put your hands to witchcraft, trust me, you whatever you did, you are now bound to that, and that is now dragging you downhill. That is robbing you because you've made an agreement. You've made an agreement with the kingdom of darkness, whether you like it or not. Now, you may feel safe by saying, well, ain't nobody know. And that's a long time. I mean, come on now. We don't care how long it happened, you know. Because the covenant is in place, even when you're dead and gone, it automatically descends. Well, in fact, it's descending on your children even now. In fact, the, the curse, the curses are up the road awaiting your children that will be birthed. How do we know this? Scriptures are very clear. The scripture says in uh, uh, Exodus 20, Exodus 20 verses 2 to 5, okay? In fact, let's, let me turn there. Let me turn this way, because I, I got to read the law to you. I'm not just reading scriptures, I'm reading the laws to you. These are the spiritual laws. Exodus 20, beginning at verse 2. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods. No, no gods. What that means is that any God that you are calling on that is not the Father of Jesus Christ, that is not the God of Abraham, then you are calling on other gods. Whether it's Mohammed, whether it's Buddha, whether you go into uh, the Sangomas, who I don't care who or what it is. Whether you saying you go into your secret society, brothers, and you all can do a ritual, any God other than the God of Abraham, you're going to have a problem. Now watch where the problem will come. Verse 3 of Exodus 20, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness or anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Listen to verse 5, because it's now about to reveal the penalties. If I do it, this is what's going to happen to my children, my grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. The Bible is going to secure a curse here that will stretch as far as the fourth generation. So what's going to happen now? Even when I'm off the scene, when I don't exist no more, my existence does not stop the curse. Because what I did was forge an agreement with the spiritual realm. That, and basically, I've sold my bloodline to the kingdom of darkness. So listen to verse 5 of Exodus 20. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Who is them again? The gods. Who are these gods? When you enter the evil altars and the spirits behind that altar that you could not see, but existed there. That's who you made the agreement with. But Kevin, I made no agreement. All I did was brought the alcohol, and I brought some cigarettes, and I brought my children photo, and I did this here. But who were you doing it to? Well, I just put it there. No, that you thought you were just putting it there. We just read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 to 21, where it says that when these Gentiles or these evil peoples are doing that sacrifice, the scripture made it very clear who they're doing it to. You're not doing it to a table altar. He says they're doing it to devils. And you cannot see devils, right? Because they're invisible. They're spiritual. Yeah. So he says here, verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, watch what I'm going to do now. If you decide to become a Freemason, if you decide to make uh, agreements with witchcraft workers and sorcery, if you decide to put Obeah in your co-worker clothes or their car or whatever, if you decide to do something from the kingdom of darkness to get ahead in life, listen what the penalty is. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. And as a result of you uh, resourcing them for power, I'm going to visit your iniquity mean your continual doing this evil of the fathers upon the children, the current ones, unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. That's scripture. That's not my opinion. Excuse me. That's scripture. So what does that mean, Kevin? That means that when Kevin, let's say I didn't have any kids as yet, when I go to the, the person, the witchcraft person, all right. Well, I, and guess what? I don't have to go to a witchcraft person. Let's use a lady. She followed the, the ritual of burying her navel string, a placenta or whatever. 
Now, you know, in some cultures, and I'm going to get deeper into that, I'm going to do my last teaching on uh, can your destiny be hijacked, where the ritual is you don't bury the placenta in some cultures, you actually eat it. Can you imagine that? Now, you know these some devils, right? You actually eat the placenta. And of course, we can deal more on that. So, you don't have to actually go to the witch doctor and say, this is what I want to do for the curse to come on you. The reality is, based on the scripture, the mere fact that you resort to another god, but Kevin, I didn't resort to another god, I didn't go to no witchcraft person. No, you did not go, but the ritual that you practice came from an altar. You may not be aware of it, and that's irrelevant, because ignorance is no excuse to the law. So when you buried that child, destiny, what you really did, you change, that child destiny was now transferred to the kingdom. That, that don't exist no more. The destiny that God had for that child, that, that you, have, you have literally altered the destiny of the child. So the spirits of the altars now control the destiny of the child. So it should not be a shocker if the child is gunned down in the streets. It should not be a shocker if the child is stabbed to death or killed, I mean, in a car accident in such a violent manner. It should not be a, 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 a shocker if, if, if the child, uh, you know, contract HIV or, and, and, and now spreading it or have this attitude that they don't care. You see, while you from the outside saying the child is rebellious, the truth is there's history behind this. You may not know what the history is because you're ignorant to connecting what you did to what this child is doing. But the reality is the spirit from that altar, just how that one lying spirit influenced the 400 spirits of, uh, of Baal, of Ahab them. This is exactly what's happening. The spirit from the altar is consistently speaking to the spirit of that child to be rebellious, to be rude, to just do things that would... The child don't even know why they're doing it. So I'm saying to those who are listening to me, if you practice that particular ritual or any ritual or whatever they told you, they might have said to you, if you want to buy luck, then bring your children photo, wrap it up on a whatever. Now take it to the graveyard and, and, and bury it someplace. Listen, what they're, what they're telling you to do, what you think is going to bring you luck or favor, when you bury those photos or whatever items of your children, the truth is, remember, the physical acts that you're doing have a far-reaching spiritual implication. It is the same as when you take communion. What did the Lord say? He said, now, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. When you eat this bread, what does this bread represent in the realm of the spirit? It represents uh, his body, his flesh. What does this wine you drink in when you do the communion, what does that represent? It represents his blood. So while you're just drinking some orange, some uh, grape juice and this little uh, biscuit or bread, while it may seem like nothing to you physically, the spiritual implication in which that carry is far-reaching. And this is why the scriptures say, for those who participate in this holy ceremony unworthily, meaning that they're life full of evil and wickedness, he says some of them are put to sleep or some of them die. So you see how something that is seemingly so insignificant, it is the spiritual implication behind it that carries a serious consequence. So it's the same thing in the kingdom of darkness. The same principle apply. Whatever they are asking you to do, all the spiritual realm is seeking is a covenant with you. But they cannot do it outside of your agreement. They cannot force you to do it. So this is why they will present these things to make it look so good. But when you bite into it, when you bite into it, you, you, it the whole destiny is going to change. So ultimately, the rituals that came from the altars, which are operated by devils, the purpose of it, the sole purpose, is to achieve the covenant, the spiritual invisible covenant, to ultimately change the destiny of the victim. It is as simple as that. So this is why, and I'm going to end right here because there's a lot more I have to cover, but I'm going to definitely do that tomorrow. This is why what is going to now become relative to what's actually happening to you spiritually in your dreams. Now you're going to look at the dreams. Why? Because the spirits from the altars, and I'm going to end with this, the spirits from the altars, the, they come now as masquerading spirits because they have the right now. They have a right now to the Ewing family. They have a right now to the Rule family. They have a right now to the Williams family. How did they get this? 
because when Mama Williams, when uh, Papa Ewing Kevin, when whoever was participating in these things, it was them who was following these rituals that opened the spiritual doors and portals for these spirits to come in, masquerading spirits. So what are they going to do now? They're going to come in the dream masquerading. Hello now. And I can give you this last example because I don't want to overdo this because I got a lot to cover. We can cover the same time tomorrow. Let's, let's look at a family. Let's look at a family where none of the women uh, are married. Or if they get married, they're married late in life. Uh, and if they do get married late in life, their marriage lasts for about 20 minutes <laughs> and they divorce, right? Now, because of what, let's say they have their mother. And I don't even need to know what they did in the past because, again, the fruit, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit which the family is producing. Okay, remember I talked to you about spiritual intelligence, how you don't look at the surface of the scripture, you look under the terrain. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to look at the fruit. Why are these beautiful women in this family educated, none of them married? Now they will tell you, oh, I don't want to be married. I can't. I don't know how people just put up with these men. No, ain't how you put up with them. You can't get no man. So get out of here. <laughs> so the reality is, what they don't know, I want you to hear me, the spirits from the altar are literally police officers in the realm of the spirit. Why I call them police officers? Because they are responsible for enforcing the covenants that were made at that altar. That's right. So watch out. Let me show you how deceptive these spirits are. So you go to the witchcraft place and you say, man, look here, I, I just tired of being broke. I won't buy luck. No, no, no problem. We can do luck. So they're going to give you a ritual to follow. Now, what you don't know is by following these rituals, which are going to be uh, adversely affect you and your bloodline. But there are curses that are being inserted with these rituals that you don't know. But who, who are bringing these things? These same spirits at the altars. How do we prove this? Well, we look at a principle. In Exodus, uh, in Exodus chapter uh, uh, 20 and verse 24, I believe it is. I believe it's verse 24. Exodus 20 verse 24. Listen to this principle about an altar. God said, and I said this to you before, God said, if you build an altar unto me, right? Meaning that the altar that you're raising, this was way back then now. We don't have to build altars anymore. Jesus Christ became the ultimate sacrifice, so there's no more setting up altars, cutting goats and sheep and all this other stuff. We don't do that no more. But the principle of the altar still remains because it's done every single second of the day in the, in the kingdom of darkness with witchcraft workers. So watch this now. He said, if you build an altar unto me, right, in the place where I put my name, I, God, who is a spirit, I will visit the altar. And I'm going to, he ain't coming empty handed, you know, when you, because he's satisfied that you're doing this in honor of him. So what is he saying? I'm going to come, read it, and I'm now bringing blessings with me. So everyone at that altar of God back then, back then, God is going to bless everybody here. But remember, God is invisible. The, the, the blessings are invisible. So even though they don't, may not see God and they just have the whatever God requires of them, remember, the destinies were altered. So whatever bad was supposed to happen is now going to turn good because God is coming and God, the blessing now is going to empower them to do what they couldn't do before. Same thing with Adam and Eve, Genesis 1 verse 28. And God blessed them. It was no physical nothing. It was spiritual. As a result of that, they were able to be fruitful, to multiply, and to replenish the earth. They couldn't do that prior to the spiritual endowment, which is the blessing. So, with that principle in mind, then the opposite is also true. So, when an evil altar is raised for sorcery practices, right? What is happening here? What, what is going on? Then the spirits of that altar, according to 1 Corinthians 10 verses 20 to 21, and Paul says you should have no affiliations with these people who are making sacrifices and they're doing it to devils. Of course, it's at an altar. So therefore, on the flip side, the altars that are being raised for demonic, for demonic evil and the spirits at that altar, what are they bringing with them? Curses. What are these curses? High blood pressure, uh, diabetes, cancers, HIV. All of these spiritual seeds are coming with them. So this is why I say to you now, now you don't need to know what the ancestors would have done. You look at the family now, and now you look for consistency. What is the consistency? Every one of the family members, every one of the siblings have high blood pressure. 
Well, how come they have it in the neighbors across the road? They don't have it. They got 600 children over there. None of them got high blood pressure. All of y'all the same age. Y'all went to school to get it and everything. How come they get it? Why these neighbors over here with all these ugly looking children with all kind of tree trunk growing out of their face and man trying to break down the door to get in there. But y'all who look like royal material, nobody wants y'all. See, I don't need to know what the ancestors did. I know what they did based on the fruit that the family is producing. If, if you, listen, the scriptures are clear. No good tree could bring forth evil fruit. No guava tree could bring forth mango. No grape tree could bring forth peanuts. It, it don't, it, even naturally, it can't happen. So what are we doing? We are looking at our bloodline and we are looking at the consistency of negativity. And this is how we determine somewhere on the bloodline, some point, someone involved themselves. It don't matter who it was because more than likely they're probably dead. But what I'm saying to you, because a covenant was established, the covenant is now dictating the destiny to everyone in that family. Everyone. This is why God said to Israel in Leviticus 26 verse 40, he said, the shut this down, you must repent of the iniquity of your ancestors, the iniquity, the transgression, and the sin. But God, they did already. I didn't ask you if they were dead. Follow the ritual, follow the rule, and you will be able to shut these things down. Let me take my time now. Because I just tired of people talking foolish. All them things saying, well, that's all he's talking about. Don't listen. Well, then shut up and go watch somebody else. And let people who want sense listen. Look, you don't got to listen. Even if you don't believe me, look at your own family. Look at you. Why everybody in your family divorced? Why? Why nobody can maintain relationship? Why the males in your family are nothing? Okay? They're like bums. And, and it ain't that they're lazy and don't want to work. It's like something on them. They cannot achieve. The women will achieve. They're doing good, but they can't keep no man. Why? You think when they had career day at school and they said, come here, sweetie, come here, Mary. Mary, what you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to have like six children for six different men. I don't want to get married to nobody, you know. I want to rent all my life and owe the bank until I die. You think that was a plan? No. No. It wasn't a plan. But you know who plan it was? When whomever made the covenant at the altar, they were rewriting the destiny of the future generation and they didn't even know. Father, I thank you for wisdom. I thank you for knowledge because I was once there. And I know what it is to be in bondage. I know what it is to be tied up in life. I know what it is to do everything within your physical human power and cannot get ahead. And every church is failing you because they don't understand spiritual laws. They don't. Jump around all day, flip up, give your neighbor a high five, tell your neighbor you love them. Jesus said the blessing around the corner. Boy, if I could only find this corner, if I could only find this corner, if I could only find this corner, things will be different, right? But you can't find the corner because to find the corner, you need to know the rules. To find the corner, you need to know the principles. All right? I'm going to stop right there tonight. I got to stop there tonight. I got to stop. Let me mark this here. I got like about, I got a million more scriptures to give you. But I promise you tomorrow I'm coming back with part two to this. I got to stop here tonight. I got to stop because the reason why I want to stop it because I want to pray. There are people on this live watching me right now. They're in tears right now. They're in tears right now because I just pulled their file during this teaching. And I'm led by the Lord to pray for you to break the ancestral and generational curses out of your life. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. I thank you that the spirit of truth had navigated us through this part one of this teaching on the mystery of masquerading spirits. I thank you, Father God, Lord, that you had ordained this time with this people before the foundation of the world. There's absolutely nothing that is happening here that is not of you or happening by chance or accident. It is the power and the spirit of the living God that is orchestrating this whole event. Father, I repent of any sin, iniquity, or transgression in my life or even in the lives of those that are listening to me right now. I'm doing this, Lord, because your word is clear. And that is, if we have any form of iniquity or unconfessed sin in our heart, you will not hear us. And we need you to hear us. So therefore, Lord, I implement your 
clause according to first John 1 and 9. What does it say? It says, if we confess our sins, that you, O oh Lord, are faithful and just to forgive us of them. And to do what? And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Father, any form of bitterness, hate, unforgiveness, pride, returning evil prayers back to sender, planning the fall of somebody else, speaking evil over them, the things that we have planted in people's yard, the things that we've participated in our own homes, seeking spiritual protection from other means other than you. Father, we repent in the name of Jesus. Father God, we express godly sorrows and putting our hand to wickedness, to foolishness, subscribing to the traditions of men that you have said in your word, according to Matthew 5 verse 6, that it was because of these tradition, these cultural things that we were doing, all of these things that were handed down that we never questioned. This became the crux. This became the epicenter as to why the word of God was not working in our lives. Father, we repent right now in the name of Jesus. We repent whatever spell we sent to someone, whatever evil words that we would have uh, spoken of other people's life. I, re I repent on behalf of those, listen to me, whatever you have planted on your property as some form of protection that had nothing to do with God. When you would have buried the afterbirth, after you had your son and your daughter, all of these things tied you up. Whatever you would have mopped, or whenever you mopped your floor with any kind of potion, whatever they gave you to drink in your body, to remove some kind of fixed father every spirit that was attached to those rituals to those ceremonies in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth we pray that the entire covenant be completely annihilated destroyed that the fire of the living God will consume it in the name of Jesus that will end every form of participation of the spirits from that altar that had the legal right to exist in these people's lives. Father, shut it down now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I pray right now, Father God, just like Elijah, Elijah was confident in spite of him and the boy being outnumbered. Elijah saw beyond the physical realm. Father, I am praying right now that the same thing that you did to Elijah's servant when Elijah prayed, by faith, I believe that you are about to do it right now when I pray. I pray just like Elijah in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would remove the scales, remove the blindness, remove the spirit spiritual web from their eyes, Lord, and now cause them to see those who would have been tied down by some lover, some whomever who would have tied them down in spiritual cages because of the other party's selfish desires, causing them to leave their homes or causing them to alter their life, not because they wanted to do it, but because they were set up spiritually to do it. Father, I pray by the blood of Jesus, release that woman's son, release that woman's husband, release that young man, release that woman, release that person in their 50s, 60s who never enjoyed their life, who never participated in the blessings that you've had for them. Why? Because they were locked down spiritually, whether it was ancestral curses, whether it was some lover, whether it was some enemy, whether it was some friend, whether it was themselves by following rituals that had nothing to do with you. Father, release them right now in the name of Jesus, I pray. Father, I pray your word. Why? Because your word declares that the angels of the Lord, the ministering spirits, it says that they hearken or listen unto the voice of the word of God. Lord, your word is clear according to your word in Proverbs 11 verse 31. And it says that the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. Father, those that are listening to me right now who have been saved for any number of years but never ever participated in the freedom, never ever participated in the joy, never ever participated in the wealth that you've assigned to them under the umbrella of the spiritual blessings that you've had in place for them before the foundation of the world according to Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4. Father this night we break every evil stronghold, we command every spiritual padlock to be crushed, destroyed and that they break out of their cages right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father catapult them into their destiny Father God make up for the years that they have lost in the name of Jesus Christ. Bring that son, bring that daughter, bring that husband bring that wife back home and cause them to participate in what you have placed for them before the foundation of the world. 
Father, I pray right now, Lord, that in every church, you expose every type of witchcraft, every one that is hiding and shielding and masquerading behind the banner of Jesus Christ while they are levying spells and capturing the souls of your people only to summon more evil powers under the guise of Christianity. Father, arrest them right now in the name of Jesus. Father, visit them right now in the name of Jesus and break the cages of the people that they have enslaved. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray right now by the blood of Jesus. I cover every home listening to me right now. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over your home right now. I pray that the Lord, the God of all grace, the Father of all lights, would remove that dark cloud of sorcery, that dark cloud of backwardness, that dark cloud of failure, that dark cloud of not enough, just enough, the spirit of poverty, rejection. Father God, I pray even now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that you would break the evil power in that place. Father, everything that was planted on their property, whether it was by a stranger, whether it was by themselves, Father, I pray right now, make the ground vomit. Make the ground vomit whatever has been planted on that property that has become a point of contact for evil powers to traffic in and out freely. Father, shut it down and bring it to an end even now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, I pray right now, According to your word, just like Elijah. Elijah told his servant, like I'm telling them right now. God said there are more that are with you than any devil in hell and their entourage that is against you. Father, by faith we believe right now. Because we have the higher number on our side. Because we have the legions of innumerable angels. Father, we will continue to speak your word to employ and deploy the angelic host to fight against the invisible forces that's coming against us. Father, I speak right now over that spirit of divide in their home, that spirit of division. Father, your word is clear in the book of Matthew chapter 12. You said, this is your principle, you said that any house or any kingdom that is divided against itself, it is impossible for it to stand. I pray right now, Father God, that every spirit of division, every spirit of discord, every spirit that is challenging those that are hearing me now or will even hear me in the future, let the angels of peace right now, according to the word of God, let the angels of peace be dispatched. How are we going to dispatch them? By speaking your word. Your word is clear. What does your word say? Isaiah 26 and 2, it says that you will keep them in perfect peace as long as their mind is stayed upon thee. Your word declares in Psalms 119 verse 165. What is it? say the law says great peace have they that love thy law and absolutely nothing shall offend them it is the word of god it is the word of what we decree we declare it why because the angels of the lord they are not hearkening to us but when we speak the word of god they will respond to the voice of god which is the word of the living god father i join my faith with these people right now wherever they are in life I pray your counsel over them right now. Your word is clear according to Psalms 19 verse 21. It says that there are many devices in the hearts of men, but only your counsel shall prevail. It is my prayer right now that that which you have ordained for them before the foundation of the world. Father, reinstate them even now in the name of Jesus. Cause them to be reconnected on their divine destiny. Wherever they were derailed, Father, put them back supernaturally. And we command the altars that once control them to be destroyed, to be obliterated, to be overturned. We silence everything. Every evil sacrifice, we silence every voice, every force that is coming against the people of God or those who want to be free. Father, just like how you rain down fire and brimstone upon the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, I am asking you, Father, to do a repeat. But this time, rain down fire and brimstone over every evil altar that has been set up against people that has caged them and caused them not to be able to go forward in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for your word because I believe in your word. I believe your word declares in Matthew verse 18, chapter 18, verse 19. It says that wherever two of us touching anything on this earth that we should ask of your father, it shall be done. I come in agreement with these people that the altars will be destroyed, that the sorcery and all of the manipulation and masquerading spirit will be exposed indefinitely and that these spirits will be cast into torment to be tormented before their time according to the word of the living God. 
I pray, Lord, that you'll restore them. Your word is clear. Your word says in Joel 2 and 25, what does it say? What does the law say? What does the word of God, which is the voice of God, is saying to the angels? It says that God will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palm worm has eaten away. The word is clear when it says in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 30 to 31, it says if the thief be found, and we have discovered him tonight. If the thief be found, he must return unto us. We, not God. God says, I've given you the authority to make this proclamation. We command every devil that has been hidden in our lives, consuming our wealth, consuming our sanity, eating up of the way of the lives of our children, causing us not to propel in our ministry, causing us not to know our gifts and talents and to begin to move in the things of God. God said, because I knew you would have been delayed, I have put a clause in my law. And if you follow my law, if you decree and declare my law, the angels of the Lord will go and put it into action for you. And therefore we speak the word of God where God says, I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palm has eaten away. You now decree, devil, I command you, you evil Satan that has eaten away the things of the lives of these people. I command you by the authority given to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to return unto them minimum sevenfold according to the name of Jesus Christ. Father, your word declares in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses uh, 35, 38, it says that we should not cast away our confidence or our belief in you as, it w as to what it is that we want. Why? Because your word, the law of God is clear. And what is the clarity? He said, if you do not cast away your belief, your confidence in his word, it shall work for you a great recompense of reward. Father, you back it up in Ephesians 3 and 20 when you said that you are always in a position to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all that we can ever ask or think according to the power that works. Father, we will continue to speak your word because you have given us the revelation that is through your word and praying the scriptures that the angels of the Lord are now employed and deployed to work and to act on our behalf. Father, I thank you right now. I come against that spirit of fear and anxiety and worry. This is not of you. This is not of you, Father God. COVID-19, 16, 17, 18 will have no stronghold on the people of God. I release upon you right now the book of Philippians that says that Jesus Christ, the God of the, 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 the Son of Peace, it is only him that can give us that peace that passes all understanding. Father, erase the worry. Erase the fear. Erase the anxiety anxiety, erase, erase the dep depression, remove all of those evil forces that has been saturating that home to keep that family at odds with each other. This was never your will for their lives. Therefore, we reject it. Excuse me, in the name of Jesus. We reject it in the name of Jesus. Everything that is not of God in our lives, we reject it. Furthermore, we back it up with the scriptures. We release the word of God, which is the laws of God. And what does it say? God says, I will pluck up everything out of your life that I did not plan there. Father, I thank you. Father, I bless you. Father, I give you the glory, the honor, the praises. I believe. I don't care what nobody say. I don't care what no preacher say. I don't care what no bishop say. I don't care what no apostle say. If they are speaking against the laws of God, if they are teaching another Jesus, uh, if they are subscribing to evil altars, Father, I pray for them. I pray that your spirit will intervene to save their lives. I pray that they will turn from their evil, wicked, and greedy ways and stop financially raping the people of God and stop preaching gospel that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stop preaching another Jesus. Father, I thank you right now. I thank you right now. I bless you right now. Father, I seal this prayer right now according to your word, which says whatsoever things we desire when we pray, we must believe that we have received it and we shall have it in the matchless and in the mighty name of our Father. I believe it. I am convinced right now that I have no angels around me because they are deployed right now. I Even the people I'm praying for right now, their angels are at work, working in the realm of the spirit, changing the things that needs to be altered to give them the desired results that they are seeking in the realm of, of the natural. I believe right now that they have the full understanding that in order to change things physically, there has to be a tweak of things spiritually so father i bless you father i honor you father i praise you and father i glorify you in the matchless in the mighty name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen and amen i don't know about you but i felt that oh yeah i feel that one it coming change coming change coming i i, I pray for all of you guys tonight tomorrow 8 30 god's best life we're gonna pick up 
and what we did here tonight was only scratching the surface of where we're going tomorrow. You need to be here. You need to hear it. Call your friend, your uncle, your dad. Call your cat and your dog. You need to hear. You need to hear where the seeds of failure were planted. And it wasn't planted when you started to encounter the troubles. No. The troubles were a manifestation. It was a blossoming of what was planted years ago. And that's what you need to hear, okay? So until tomorrow, God bless you. And again, 8.30 tomorrow, Monday, God's best life. We will be back with part two with the mystery behind masquerading spirit. God bless you.